I want to welcome you to our annual Mildred and George Weissman program. It's been endowed by, um, by their children, Paul, Ellen, and Dan Weissman, in honor of their parents. I also want to thank Mildred and her children um, who are sitting over here this evening. Thank you for coming. I also want to remind you that we have just opened our third floor um, exhibition, which is our collection, and it's quite a big deal. Please, please, if you haven't seen it yet, after the program, go up there. We're open till 8 o'clock. I also am not going to do a big introduction, but I am delighted. I am so, so delighted to welcome Judy Glickman Lauder and Laura Levitt for this program this evening. I, I, knew to, I do know that Jenna Weiss is going to get up and introduce them more formally, but I just want to welcome them here and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I also was going to mention that tonight's program, Constructed Memory, the Holocaust in Photography and Film, is being held in conjunction with Scenes from the Collection. And we have a number of other upcoming talks, performances, and workshops connected to the exhibition. So for details about all of our upcoming public programs, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Judy Glickman Lauder is an internationally recognized photographer and philanthropist. Her photographs have been exhibited worldwide and are represented in two traveling exhibitions, Holocaust, the Presence of the Past, and Resistance and Rescue, Denmark's Response to the Holocaust, which is also the subject of a forthcoming publication this fall. Her work is represented in numerous collections, including the Getty Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the, Museum of Metropol the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the United States Holocaust Museum. She is represented by Howard Greenberg Gallery in New York City. Her published books of photography include Upon Reflection, Photographs, Both Sides of the Camera, Photographs from the Collection of Judy Ellis Lott Glickman, and For the Love of It, The Photography of Irving Bennett Ellis. Presently, Miss Lauder is a member of the Getty Museum Photographic Council and the Photographic Visiting Committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and is a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain. Laura S. Levitt is Professor of Religion, Jewish Studies, and Gender at Temple University, where she has served as Chair of the Department of Religion and directed the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies and the Jewish Studies programs. She is completing a book about trauma, loss, and how material artifacts make these painful legacies manifest, entitled Tainted Objects, Holocaust Evidence and Criminal Archives. She is the author of American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust and Jews and Feminism, The Ambivalent Search for Home. She is an editor of the volumes Judaism Since Gender and Impossible Images, Contemporary Art After the Holocaust. In addition to these endeavors, Levitt has coordinated the Greater Philadelphia Women's Studies Consortium and is currently a member of the board of directors of the Association for Jewish Studies. Now please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Judy Glickman Lauder and Laura Levitt. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and to, to be able to um, celebrate the new exhibition, to call attention to um, this work, Judy's work, and um, what we're going to do tonight um, to sort of make this conversation work is that um, I'm going to give you a couple of opening um, thoughts and comments to kind of get us started. And then um, Judy's going to show you a bit of her larger project, the work that um, the photographs in the exhibition come out of. And this is the volume that Aperture will be publishing this September. This September. So, and I think there are cards out there, so you might want to check.
check that out. Um, so if you haven't been in the new exhibition, I really want to encourage you, as um, Jenna has encouraged you, to go upstairs. And it was a great pleasure to get to spend time in the exhibition with Jenna this afternoon for me, having read a great deal and looked at many of these things not in the flesh. So I'm very happy to have made it from Philadelphia to have been able to do that tonight. And so one of the things that um, I want to say about the exhibition overall is that it really is um, not a passive um, project. It really is a provocation. It's really asking viewers who come to the museum to think about the objects that are on display, the ways in which they talk to each other, the ways in which they may um, conflict with each other. Um, and and they ask us to think about the challenges of collecting, of holding, of displaying uh, works of art on the one hand, and works um, that are somehow connected to Jewish life and to Jewish culture and to the Jewish past. So art and artifacts that speak to those legacies. And so part of what I hope we'll talk about today is under the rubric of um, masterpieces and curiosities, which are themselves very complicated terms when we think about Holocaust memory um, and the works of the extraordinary artists um, who, uh, who made work in Theresienstadt, like the beautiful and haunting bracelet, those charms um, at the center of the exhibition. And um, what I hope we will do tonight is think about the ways in which contemporary works of photography about Holocaust memory and the desire to both touch that past and some of the impossibility that sort of sh casts a shadow over even these very extraordinary uh, curiosities and masterpieces that are in the exhibition. I think this is some of the work that Judy's photography does. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to Judy, who's going to show you some images. And then I'll come back and I'll ask her some questions. And um, we'll start a conversation. But it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. So, Laura, thank you so very much. Just in meeting Laura and finding out more about her, Oh my goodness, the classes that she teaches at Temple University, we would all love to be able to take. They just sound amazing, totally. What a treat to be here. Love the Jewish Museum. Thank you, thank you. Scenes from the collection, if you haven't been, uh, it's really remarkable, and it takes more than one time to take it all in. It's so beautifully put together. Claudia and Claudia and everybody, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Judy, I'm a photographer, grew up in California. Uh, I've been a photographer most of my life. My dad was a doctor, but his passion was photography. And I'm black and white film still. I do color digital too, but I'm really mostly film. And, uh, have always been interested in Judaism and have kind of come to this period of history kind of over a number of years, uh, photographing survivors, being involved with a Holocaust Museum, actually an early one in Los Angeles. It wasn't until 1988 that I was actually able to go into a camp and it was an experience that kind of turned me all around. I'll show you a few images. The images upstairs are of Theresienstadt, and the bracelet, it is just such a story. Uh, it was done by a survivor, uh, Gilda or Goethe Perlman, and each piece, um, well, you'll take a peek, and they have some wonderful description uh, it's very, very, very special and very poignant, and I feel honored to be a part of this. I think I'm going to stand, and let's see here. Well, there's that. This is, this is actually the um, railroad station right near Theresienstadt. It's called Bohusovis Train Station. 
This film is actually infrared, black and white infrared film. It shows the infrared rays of light as well that we can't see in the naked eye as well as the ultraviolet. It kind of gives it a little bit of a haunting, kind of a timeless uh, feeling for me anyway as a photographer. And most of my work is straight triax, but I always have two cameras and I have been involved with um, infrared for many, many years, since the 70s. Train tracks, this is actually from uh, tracks that I have, are walking along from Warsaw to Treblinka in Poland. This has to do with deceit. Work shall make you free. Arbeit macht frei. Uh, I've photographed this in many different camps. The same, the same words. This is Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt, a cell. Auschwitz, a cell. Majdanek. A barrack. This is Auschwitz. This is a crematorium where they actually have a, it's one of the ovens is glassed in, and there was a woman standing. It's called Reflection of a Woman Viewing an Oven. Uh, I'm sort of in the shadows on the left. Uh, it, this was my first trip to Auschwitz. I've been there three times. It, this image kind of turned me all around. Uh, it just made this whole period of history just immediate and real to me. Talking about the technology, the gas. This is in Theresienstadt. Again, the deception, people carefully labeled their suitcases thinking that they were gonna be settled here for a period of time and would go back to their own homes and so on. This is an image also at Theresienstadt of a woman mourning her grandmother. This is actually in the crematorium there. This is infrared film. Uh, this is the execution wall at Auschwitz. And because the flowers, it's now kind of like a memorial. People come and they bring flowers. Fla live flowers reflects the light, infrared light, and makes it very glowy. And uh, the wreaths are like dried flowers, and people put live flowers and buds and so on right there in the hole. And if you can see, it, it just sort of, the shapes of the stems and so on, or it just um, created a feeling that I was feeling at the time. This is called Why Did the Heavens Not Darken? It is Birkenau, the tracks, and the, uh, the quote is actually, um, Laura, can I just have to Absolutely. for one second? I was so haunted by the picture. Because the quote is kind of pointed. Why did the heavens not darken and the stars not withhold their radiance? Why did not the sun and the moon turn dark? This is from the Chronicle of Solomon bar Simeon on the massacre of the Jews in Mans by the Crusaders during the First Crusade, 1096 AD. I was very privileged to be asked to go to Denmark and to put together an exhibit 
dealing with the rescue of the Danish Jews in World War II. Going into Denmark, this was in the early 90s, was like breathing fresh air for me. I was able to meet people who, while occupied by Nazi Germany, the Danes rose as a nation and they were able to save 90 somewhat percent of their Jewish population. I'm not gonna tell the whole story tonight. Uh, it will be in the book, so be sure in September, pick up the book, but learn about the Danish story because it's quite extraordinary. It's a story of hope and it's a story of moral courage. Oh, the first one is Jan Muller, fisherman, rescuer, Well, this is Gilalai Fishing Village in Denmark, where many of the boats uh, left from. Uh, they crossed the Or Sound into Sweden because by 1943, Sweden had opened up its harbors, so they had a place to go. Rescuer Karen Leek Polson. She was a teenager at the time, on a bicycle, helping people, even getting luggage into boats. This is Frode Jakobsen, early resistance leader, unbelievable person. It was such a pleasure to be able to meet these people, interview them, and photograph them. This is called the Dark Wave. I'm actually on a fishing boat that was actually in World War II. Uh, and we're in the Or Sound and we're crossing. That's the Nakahovid Lighthouse, that's in Denmark. And you had to go by that to get over into Sweden to cross the Sound. And the fishermen were very smiley because it was all occupied by the Gestapo and they were able to go under their nose because the, um, the light of the lighthouse went straight out and their small boats were able to go under it and they were able to, to do this. And I think that is it. Oh, that's the book. <laughs> Laura. Okay, um, so you've gotten a little bit of a taste of some of the work that, um, that Judy has done over the course of now almost thir over 30 years. Um, of really um, bringing the story, t these stories to life, both the the horror and also this story of hope that comes out of um, of the Danish experience. But what I want to really ask us to do today is to really think about the work that is here on display as part of this um, special exhibition and to think about some of what it, what it asks us to consider in relation to this beautiful um, and poignant object, the, the bracelet. Um, and again, the bracelet is, when we think about charms, they're like talismanic objects, right? Um, and the taint of that is both they're magical and powerful and poignant, but also really terrible, right? Because they come out of this place where they, they were used as barter. And the idea that they survived is itself quite extraordinary. Not unlike the Hanukkiah that's upstairs that was hidden. It's a wooden Hanukkiah that was uh, used in the camp and hidden under the floorboards or somewhere so that they could take it out each year. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that there, part of it was, um, uh, <coughs> was burned because <laughs> it was made out of wood and, some, and obviously uh, a candle got got um, too, too low. Um, but one of the things that I think that the photographs do, and I want Judy to talk about this, is um, on the one hand, we, when we think about photographs, we think about their indexicality, the ways in which they are um, a trace of something that was there, right? Um, and Judy went back to camps in order to photograph um, there and to try to help us imagine and um, get closer to touching that past. And I love that she uses 
um, infrared or um, in some of the other images she uses solarized um, uh, techniques as ways of getting at that which is both palpable but also not visible by the human eye. And that's part of what I think this idea of trying to capture this past is about and it's difficult and it's also distant. And so I think what, what I'd like to first ask Judy to talk about is the final image in the series in the room which is the young woman who is outside of the crematoria mourning her grandmother. And I'd like you to talk about both the, your, where you are in relation to that because it is just such a careful image. It's both respectful in its distance and yet at the same time it has this intimacy. And I'd like you to sort of talk about how you put that together and how you think it also um, reflects back on the, this exhibition and, and, and what, it, what it demands of us. It was a moment in a crematorium in Theresienstadt and I was walking around trying to see all the different objects and images and then I saw her and I did not want to break the moment because she was very intense and I wanted to, to respect that and uh, it was just, you know, it was really just a moment, and I kept my distance, and I just felt that I was able to capture a little bit of what was going on with her. Well, and I, I, I think part of why I'm so drawn to that image in this room mm -hmm. upstairs is that in some ways, what you, what you perform for us is what is our relationship to this past and what is a respectful distance from some of us who have family who died and some of us who um, feel close to this because we're Jewish or because um, we're queer in some way or and where we have an identification with some of the people who died and yet at the same time recognizing our distance from that. And I, what I love about that image and the way, the, the sort of carefulness of the way you capture that moment is you don't exploit her. You, you hold back and I think that that's part of the challenge for those of us in the present, particularly those of us who are not from survivor families and who both feel profoundly moved by this history but also trying to figure out how we don't appropriate somebody else's past. Um, so. No, I agree, except that it's kind of interesting because originally after the war, no one talked about the Holocaust. And there was a feeling even among survivors of humiliation, of shame, of why, how did I survive and so much family didn't and so on. In today's world, it's kind of sad, but to go back and to really delve into all of this and everything that has gone on uh, seems to me to be more important and more applicable than probably at any other time. It's, um, it, it's just, I don't know. I'm. I myself am getting very affected by everything all over again. I'm just reading so much. I have uh, two of my sons are rabbis. My oldest son is t uh, left actually today for Bangladesh. Why? Because the Rohingya people are all there. They're migrating there under horrible circumstances. The world is just turned upside down. It's, you know, uh, ethnic cleansing. It's, it's like practically, I mean, they're really trying to get rid of a people. And that's only one example of what is going on in the world today. And um, the feeling of the photograph I know that you love, uh, it just brings everything back that all of this happened 
and we can't allow this to ha keep happening. And that's one reason that um, I just felt so privileged to be in Denmark and to learn a little bit about this, that you know, us human beings can make a difference and uh, in every way, shape, and form. And um, so I think I'm off the question. I'm going to let no, you continue. That, no, I, I, no, I so appreciate this. And when you had told me earlier today about mm -hmm. your son, again, part of when we think about, about Holocaust and Holocaust memory and keeping memory alive, part of the way we do that is by asking, what is it that this legacy teaches us about the ways in which we perform as human beings, right? And, and the ways in which we think about the world and we think about the vulnerable among us, um, both here and, um, and abroad, and the sort of vulnerability of people who have no place to go and who are singled out because they are othered and what we do in relation to that. And then when we look at, a, at the kind of work that is on display upstairs, we think, okay, so here are people who were being forced, many of them artists, to, to create works for, um, for the people who, are, who had ha held them captive and so there are these beautiful, very delicate paintings and drawings, and yet, at the same time, these same people used the, the tools that were given to them, they snuck them back and made works that showed the degradation of what was going on. And they were able to smuggle some of those out or to hide other ones. So that the Hanukkah that I was talking about, um, Jenna was able to tell me some of the backstory. It turns out that that Hanukkah was made by um, an artist who was married to another artist who was also in the camp. And if you see them in the room, it's next to this, um, this beautiful illuminated um, uh, work that was done, it was, it's a psalm that was done in the camp by the wife of the man who made the Hanukkah, and she made it for Rabbi Leo Beck. Um, and so the idea that people were able to produce these things is also a way of reminding us of the humanity and the um, the, 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 the power of these other human beings because sometimes that degradation dehumanizes and so the work is also a way of reminding us of the humanity of the people who are on the street or are, are in refugee camps or are trying to cross um, from Libya into some part of Europe um, with nothing and um, it's really, really hard to remember that. And so the work does ask us to kind of go that extra mile. And at the same time, the sort of memory of the past, the not forgetting, is also what the, f the photographs are doing. They're asking us to, um, not, to, to not allow that legacy to somehow fade away so that and how do we do that with some kind of integrity? How do we do that without pretending we know more than we know? At the same time, how do we get, let ourselves come closer? And so in your photographs, Judy, part of what I think you do by using these different techniques is to try to give us some of the texture of what it feels like to be there and to be there in the present with that distance, uh, trying to imagine that past, like that amazing image of the woman at you know um, in front of the um, the crematoria, or actually uh, that's the um, I, the oven. I I couldn't go there. <laughs> it's going into the camps. At first, um, I didn't. I wasn't really sure I wanted to. I didn't know if I would ever sleep again, and so on and so on. Uh, I did go, and uh, I went with my son. My family urged me to go, and I went with one of my sons, and um, just for two days, there was a trip that was going on the way to Israel, just stopping at Auschwitz and Birkenau. And those two days um, just turned me all around, and it was kind of became kind of a mission I needed to go back and I needed to record what I was feeling and seeing. And basically, 
Uh, Laura, you're talking about a photograph of a live person right there. Most of my work really, to me, sort of deals with going into these camps, I really had a feeling of the souls, the people who had departed. Uh, you're walking, especially during the 80s, some of these camps I think have been kind of more modernized and more museum-y, uh, but you're on earth that has ash and has bones and you're in barracks you're, that were old horse barracks and you're everywhere. And um, I just felt that, I, I guess I felt I had something to express and that I could do something with my cameras that was me and that was deeply felt and Laura, I'm very complimented that you are very taken you know, by that image. So I really wanna thank you. Well, and thank you. And I think, again, the other thing that you're saying to us is, I wanna go back to where you began, where I, you talked I do about. I go back. <laughs> where, 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 I mean, part of what Judy was remembering is that after the war, we think about the Holocaust as ubiquitous in, in a kind of cultural imaginary, but for a very long time, that shame and the discomfort and the desire to just get on with it and not talk about it was, was I think, part of what motivates, as I'm listening to you now, the kind of, the kind of um, commemorative work that you were doing in the 80s. And again, if we think about the 80s, you think about um, a book like Mouse that comes out in the 80s. I mean, we think about these things because there's so much, there is a, a kind of plethora in a, in a, and it's, it's a good thing, right? That there's a lot of Holocaust memory, but it's hard. It's hard to animate that past. And so you keep trying it from one angle, from another angle, in order to try to get a sense of it, in order to be able to mourn those losses. Because in Jewish ritual, the rituals around, around deaths and mourning are impossible when you don't have a body that you can attend to. Where are the graves that you attend to? So these are sites that, that, that offer traces of how we can begin to do that labor, right? Mm 